so here we are. A thief, two thugs, an assassin, and a maniac. But we're not going to stand by as evil wipes out the galaxy. I guess we're stuck together. Partners. Are you telling me the fate of 12 billion people is in the hands of these criminals? Oh, yeah. Ben, I will always remember where I was on the 31st of July, 2014. Yeah, I can tell. How about you? Well, yeah, I can see why, because I was watching Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. To be honest, I can remember where I was on the uh, on the 24th of July, uh, <laughs> 2014 as well, but we'll, <laughs> we'll gloss over that. You son of a bitch. I can't believe you won, <laughs> uh, you won the premiere tickets for this. Um, of all the films that you could have done it. I know. What a wonder. I just popped it. up on my internet one day, and it was just like, to enter the competition, enter your email address. I was like, yeah, all right. Oh god! You, yeah, you, All I had to do. If, if you were ever <laughs> going to win anything, that was not a bad thing to win. Yeah, it could have been Hercules. It could have been fucking Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that, eh? <laughs> but uh, no, it was Guardians of the Galaxy, and I, in the in the sort of spoiler-free article I wrote, I talk about like these key moments in cinema, and you know where you were, and I always get jealous of people who said they queued up for the original Star Wars, and this was the closest I think we're ever going to come to that. Until episode seven. <laughs> well, <laughs> this, I can't remember which uh, review I was reading, but they said that um, Guardians of the Galaxy has captured what many people remember about the original trilogy without giving us the original trilogy. That when Star Wars comes back, it's going to have an even harder job now. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Um, I, I mean, we've been hyping this movie and we've been like anticipating this. I don't know if we've been hyping it. We've been anticipating this movie. I mean, who listens to this for fucking hype? But... Um, <laughs> we've been anticipating this movie for a long time you know it's it's kind of been on our radar since it was announced uh, I've kind of gone for like a weird thing of like when it was announced I was like what the fuck's this I don't care yeah. about it why are Marvel wasting my time with bollocks like this too alright now I'm hiring a bit more details about it I, I'm quite interested to finally like seeing some tangible footage and going damn man this looks really fucking good to getting like genuinely excited I think the last time I was that like anticipating a film and that excited about film was probably The Dark Knight Rises thinking, um, thinking back I can't think of another film I was ex- literally excited for since The Dark Knight Rises I think I was definitely excited for the original the for the Avengers was Dark Knight Rises not it's- after that though it was, yeah, but um, I, yeah, well, I guess, yeah, Dark Knight Rises then. I can't maybe the, maybe there's something else, but nothing comes to mind. Um, yeah. It's like it's a, and even if like top ten films, right? I couldn't name ten films that I've been on this level of excitement about. Yeah, and it's really weird because neither of us like are fans of Guardians of the Galaxy. In fact, like if we were, we'd certainly be in the minority. Guardians of the Galaxy as a franchise is is both a strange and obscure one, and it's something that Marvel seem to have, have had trouble with wrestling with uh, in, over the last like, 20, 30 years. It's gone through a lot yeah. of weird and wonderful changes. Um, it's, it's, it's been short-lived, even at its best. Um, it just never seems to have found a particular niche audience to, to keep it going. Um, I mean, we've talked about it before, but the original Guardians of the Galaxy has nothing to do with what we've got in this film. It was about a group of superheroes who live far in the future and defend the, the what's remaining of the galaxy uh, in, in the future. Um, then you had uh, the Gardens of the Galaxy as we kind of know them now, except the roster in the comic books is a lot bigger than the one we get in the film. And I think the best, or what's generally the most loved version of Gardens of the Galaxy was about the 2008-2009 run, which tied into events such as the Annihilation, Annihilation War, uh, the War of Kings, yeah. and the Thanos Imperative. And that's what this movie draws from. In, in, yeah, heavily. In it was the work of Dan Abnett um, in the writing staff uh, for the two thousand eight nine run was definitely. You can even see it just in the visuals, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, all, a lot of the, basically what I get the impression is, at least what I've heard James Gunn say, is that he took um, the the best the characters he liked best from that run and put them in the movie. Uh, but there's also a current version of Guardians of the Galaxy ongoing now, which has gone through its first volume, where Iron Man joined them for a little bit, and I think they're in volume two now, where goddamn uh, Venom and uh, Miss Marvel, or she's Captain Marvel now, yeah, uh, are joined them as well. So they're trying to make them like, give them another good run now, uh, but I get the impression it's not actually that great compared to the the two, 2008 run. 
Um, but anyway, well, I mean, it's got legs now. I mean, I picked up um, from my comic book store the other day. I have yet to read it, but it looks good. Just Star Lord. Um, it, and you know, it's just about him. Looks looks pretty awesome. Is that the the I modern think, run? Pun. It's the... brand new. Came out last week. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, so I don't know what it's in relation to. I don't know if it's a reprint of something else, but it was the first thing, and I was just like, I'm having that. Because um, I think it's more... Certainly the film proves that character is possibly the most defining thing in a superhero movie now. And yeah. people like the characters in Guardians of the Galaxy. Maybe that's where the problem is, because these characters are amazing. Yeah, yeah and I think, James future, Gunn, but... I think James Gunn did a good job. I mean, he picked, he picked the characters he liked the best, and I'd, I'd suggest he possibly picked the core characters of the Guardians, really. Um... There's a few characters who you could, I could quite happily see coming into a sequel, but for, for just introducing them and introducing the wider cosmic aspects of the Marvel Universe in the film, uh, I think you, you think he did well in trimming it down because you'd end up with a, a team that's more sprawling the event than the Avengers if you kind of went the whole hog. And he 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 gave us the kind of core team of uh, Peter Quill, aka Star Lord, who's played by Chris Pratt, uh, Gamora. Who's well? Not she's not so much in the film, but in the comic, she's known as the most deadly woman in the in the in the universe. Uh, played by mm-hmm. Zoe Saldana. You got Drax the Destroyer, played by Dave Bautista. Um, Groot, the the giant tree, uh, voiced by Vin Diesel, and Rocket Raccoon, or as he's just known in the film, simply Rocket, uh, voiced by Bradley Cooper. And they, I mean, they they come together, and they're they're, they're a great team. I, I I like these better than the Avengers. Yeah, me too. Certainly, they're more fun. They're more human, even though they're not more human. Yeah, like it's just a really, <laughs> they've got like yeah, they, they have a much kind of broader range of of emotions, and there's a lot more emotion in this than the in the Avengers. Like the Avengers is basically like let's throw all our favorite characters together and let them like fight something big and smashy, 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 and that's great. But because it's just, like the Avengers are kind of like event films, you know, they're just there for the fun and the spectacle. And if you yeah. want, if you want the deeper character interactions, go and watch their individual movies. That's kind of the attitude I always get with them. Um, whereas this doesn't really do that at all. It, 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 because it is an individual movie. Despite this being a team, the Guardians of the Galaxy are essentially a single, a singular entity, much like Iron Man is. And then yeah. you've got to kind of go explore these characters. But I think this does a great job of straight off the bat. Does a great job of introducing people to the wider cinematic, wider Marvel universe and bringing that into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and then introducing you to these these characters that are. That are all. I mean, one thing this film does really well is that all these characters are I, instantly identifiable due to their their visual uh, design. Everyone looks has a has a unique look to them. Um, everyone has a unique character that's very different from the other members of the team, and they're just you know you, you get you just get to get to know them really well, and it's a, it's fun getting to know these characters and seeing yeah. how they interact and seeing how different they are, yet how how fun they are while they they, they interact. Um, it was really good. Um, so, I mean, very much, despite this being an introduction to everybody, the main character and very much his film is uh, Star Lord, Peter Quill, played by Chris Pratt. He's the one yeah. that the film opens with. He's very much the main character. He's pretty much like a Han Solo style character. Yep, definitely. He's like the lovable rogue, the lovable space rogue. Um, I mean, the film starts with him kind of. He's he's part of this crew called the Ravagers, who are kind of like space pirates or space Looks scavengers. Like, yeah. And uh, he's pretty much betraying their their leader, um, and like just, they're basically like his adopted family as such. And he's kind of betraying them, and it, 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 his betrayal leads him into this kind of galactic war between um, this kind of humanoid race called the Zandarians, who are who are home to the Nova Corps, who are essentially like intergalactic police, and the uh, Kree, who are this race of blue skinned people, that are very very powerful, very um, technically advanced. Uh, except that they've had this ongoing hostility between these two empires, and they, they eventually signed a peace treaty, except one of the Kree kind of zealots called Ronan the Accuser decides he doesn't want to do the peace treaty, so he's going to go ahead and try to make war on the uh, the Zandarians anyway. And yeah. Chris Pratt's kind of escapades of him trying to like hunt for treasure, basically get him involved in this intergalactic conflict. It's, apart from the backdrop, I mean, this is standard Marvel Cinematic Universe fare. There's, there's a MacGuffin that the big bad wants the heroes have it, or and then they have to chase it and get it back and stop him from using it. 
it's it's pretty much the storyline of all the other ones. Yeah, and that's but, that's maybe one of the weaker things about this film. Yeah. Mar- Marvel films, is, uh, and on the, on the whole, is a lot of them seem to revolve around MacGuffins, and I think that's because Marvel have got an idea of where these MacGuffins are all going to come together and go. Yeah, um, and I get the impression that in this one, it wasn't it wasn't as overt almost as any other ones. It felt the MacGuffin felt like it fit better. Yeah, it, 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 this one it comes as close to kind of. I mean, we we like we, we've talked about it before, but ultimately, like at least what I believe is the Avengers three will be the the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, which is a big storyline, a yes. uh, big huge event on a, on the galactic scale in the Marvel comics. And for something like as nerdy as that to come to mainstream cinema is pretty fucking exciting. But this is <laughs> the first; it's kind of been hinting subtly at the, the, that that Infinity Gauntlet story since the Avengers. Yeah. Um, and like Thor two picked up on it again, and this picks up on it again. But this shows its players like plays its hand a lot wider than it ever has before. Because not only do you have something being actively referred to as an Infinity Stone in this movie, rather than just some kind of random artifact, um, you have the big baddie who will probably be the 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 baddie. Well, has to be the baddie in the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, and yeah. that's Thanos. Um, who is seen in the post credit stinger in the Avengers as being the mastermind behind the Chitari invasion. Um, and Loki, and Loki yes, um, Yeah, so in, in that, it's a very similar storyline, actually, but if you imagine you didn't see this storyline happening, so well, Loki wanted to destroy Earth or command Earth. Thanos yeah. helped him, but in return he gave him the Tesseract. In this one, he's going to help Ronan destroy Xandar, and Ronan's going to give him the other Infinity Stone. Yeah, yeah, it kind of is. Um, so if that if that's one thing, this this film does follow like a similar template that we've seen before, but it's not really the overall template that's the strength of this film. Yeah, it's it's kind of what it does in between that because it it kind of does. I don't things... feel the Infinity Stone was the point of this film. No, no, it was that, what the villain was going to use almost, but it, it, it wasn't of, about it, the stone. It, it kind of is. It's almost like this, the point the film's kind of twofold. There's one is to introduce us to the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, as a team, as, as characters, and then the other one is to move the kind of the Infinity Gauntlet story closer to, to the Avengers 3 target. Um, and like the, the Infinity Stones, like, it, it's, it's not, well, it's, it's basically just the, the weapon that the bad guy is going to use uh, while kind of pushing towards the, the Infinity Gauntlet. And it's basically you get you've got to get to know the, the Guardians of the Galaxy while they try to stop the Infinity Stone. And I think it's kind of twofold, yeah. um, trying to introduce a new franchise and move it forward to their big end game thing. Uh, it'd be interesting. Correct, we're getting um, Guardians two before Avengers three. Yes, which I can see Thanos being in it more again. Yeah, uh, but I mean, the, like Thanos, we talked about him before. He's he's the he's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, villain in in Marvel kind of comics. Uh, so it's really interesting to see him come on. Being voiced by Josh Brolin. Josh Brolin. Which is quite good. Yeah. Uh, you actually saw yeah. a lot more of Thanos in this movie than I thought you would. Yeah, me too. I wasn't expecting it. And honestly, the guy, not when I went to the premiere, when I went to the opening night, the guy sitting next to me, I don't know him, I swear down, he came in his pants. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was interesting. Like, <laughs> I think, like I was talking to a friend who's a big Marvel junkie, um, and he was saying like he didn't know if he liked Thanos because he looked a bit too kind of cartoony. I was thinking, he yeah, did it, he did a little bit, but that he looked exactly like he does in the comic. Like, that's what he looks like. How do you yeah. how do you do that? Like, he's a he's a huge fucking guy with like what you can only describe as knuckles for a chin. Yeah, um, and he's purple and. Wears giant like yeah, ar- gold and blue armor, and like that's that you know they pretty much captured him fairly spot on, really. I didn't. I didn't think he looked too comic. I didn't think he looked out of place either. It looked about right in the world that um, Guardians like sees itself in. Yeah, you're right. He didn't look ridiculous. Um, you know, there's all sorts of colorful people in this film. <laughs> how some of the aliens were just like it was like sixty Star Trek. I was like, well, you'll be red and you'll be green. And there's, there's no effort to like make them look any more alien than that. Yeah, I did like that. When I um, like what what surprised me about this film actually is uh, that a lot of it is practical effects. Like there's not a huge yeah. amount of CGI on kind of like scene to scene basis. Like obviously a lot of the big more spectacle stuff you've got Rocket, Raccoon, and Groot as uh, full CGI. But a lot of the actual scenery is like just sets, big sets. Yeah, um, you can't beat it like that. that opening set, which you've seen in the trailer where he first receives the orb. That's like pulled straight out of Indiana Jones. Real, it looks like a real temple. 
Yeah, and you've got the um, the kiln, the big prison. That's that that yeah. was a full build set. You've got uh, nowhere. That was a full set. Um, I'm pretty sure Ronan's ship would have been a full set. Yeah, I guess most of it would have been. You just compare that to something like I know it's it's not fair to compare it to an older film, but like to a, a Star Wars of the prequel trilogy, and it's just like it already looks dated. I and do that you're like, right. Aging as quickly. Yeah, well, that's it. That, that, that's it. You CGI. It doesn't matter how good it is. It dates quicker than practical shit, in in my opinion. It's like yeah. I think some CGI looks flashy when it first comes out, but it, it dates badly unless it's really uh, unless it's very very good or very very stylized. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, the, the, what what impressed me is you see there was a lot of practical effects, a lot of extras just in makeup and stuff, which yeah. looked really cool. Um, what I liked as well is, you say, like, some people were, like, uh, there was a lot of pink people, like, really, like, shocking pink skin people. And yeah. there was, like, some people who were blue, who I presume were Cree. Um, and, you know, there was just different species. And it, it kind of, it didn't feel like there was just random aliens here and there. It felt like there were, like, set species, like, you're a such and such and you're oh, a yeah. thing. And that, that was quite good because it made the, the universe feel a bit more lived in. Um... But yeah, I really like this. Didn't like one thing I, I did like about this film is it didn't really feel like a Marvel movie. It didn't feel like a superhero movie. I mean, we've said that it kind of follows the same story beats and the same story pattern as other things, but it felt more like a sci-fi film in the vein of Star Wars or, or Serenity or something like that. Yeah. Which yeah, I mean, it's awesome. Serenity probably probably played heavily into it because um, I'm guessing Joss Whedon at least talked to James Gunn a bit. I'm assuming he did a bit more than that, but. Um, you know, with Avengers 2 coming out, Avengers 3 eventually, I'm sure Joss is on, involved. Um, but, you know, I went into this film, yeah, I, I didn't look at it as a Marvel film, I looked at it as a sci-fi film show, but I looked at it as a James Gunn film. Yeah. Because there's something special about, like, I mean, he's only done, what, two proper features? Uh, uh, Slither Super and Slither. And Super, both of which I love. Yeah, they're amazing, I mean, each for, for their own very obscure reasons, but they're both amazing <laughs> films, and I think my excitement peaked um, and then never let off from the moment they announced him as the director. Yeah, Such he a was. Really special. Yeah, I think you're right. He seems to be the guy who, who's really tied this all together. As much as I really like the cast, I really like the kind of, you know, Marvel actually green lighting this in the first place, getting him to do this. He's the guy who seems to have tied this together. It's got all the hallmarks of like a James Good movie. It's, it's, it's just very confident in being different and weird. Yeah. And it doesn't give a shit because... It's just going to go for it, and it, it, because it goes for it, it's actually quite good. That's, yeah, and if you compare what we were saying in the Hercules thing to the G.I. Joe thing, G.I. Joe went for it. It didn't, yeah, it, it didn't did. go for somewhere particularly good, but it went for it. At least it tried. And, yeah. It missed and the mark. <laughs> but this is um, something that I think that tries, and because James Gunn is, you know, he's a talented director, he's a much better director yeah. than Brett Ratner. He he manages yeah. <laughs> to tie it together, and he brings all these like kind of weird, obscure, different threads together to create something that was just fun and different and exciting. I mean, one thing that's really like it's completely weird about this film is it's set in space, but the whole soundtrack's kind of like seventies <laughs> pro prog rock and cheesy like power ballads <laughs> yeah, and classics and, and Motown <laughs> and shit. It's like all seventies <laughs> classics, uh, but like really kind of cheesy seventies classics. And it's so good. It's ridiculous. Like, I would yeah. never sit down and listen to, to a lot of the bands here, but I've had the, the, uh, the awesome mixtape. <laughs> yeah, I've like, played it non-stop. <laughs> for ages, and it's just so good. Like, there's a really good bit in this film where they're flying into uh, nowhere, which is one of the locations in the movie, and it's just kind of like shots of, of the Milano Star Wars ship flying through, and it's a David Bowie song. I think it's a David Bowie song. Yeah, um, Moon Age Daydream. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like the music, and this like, it's just so cool, like, the scene. It, it feels like it should be on the cover of, like, a, a prog rock album. Yeah. I think that that same song plays, like, later on, like, towards the climax of that scene when um, Chris Pratt and Gamora is floating in space. And yeah, just the two of like... them, like, on the backdrop of everything without the ship. That's just, that was, like, an epic, like, shot as, it, as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, actually, you're right, actually. There are some really, really pretty really, really gorgeous shots in this film yeah. that make use. And you know one thing, actually, if we're talking about stuff like this, one thing this film does very well, and I don't say this often, 3D was damn good. Yeah, it was great. I liked it. Um, it was interesting when it was used uh, sort of just as expansion of the scenes and giving depth to proceedings. Yeah, and... it, was, it, ne it was never gimmicky. 
uh, it just was used very effectively. Like there's a bit where I mean the bit you see where Gamora and Star Lord are floating in space and there's loads yeah. of debris around them and stuff. That looked really good. There's a bit early on where Star Lord's running away and there's a bit where he jumps and there's like a big shot of him jumping and there's like a great sense of depth as he jumps towards it's the like, screen. It's almost like a CG contra zoom. I've never seen a shot like that one because he doesn't move. It's like the whole. Like, you, you're moving at the same rate that he's jumping, so everything behind him is just moving backwards. Yeah, it was really cool, and yeah. it looked great in 3D, and there was just other bits and pieces here and there that looked, like, just fantastic. Um, there's a bit that's kind of, like, a couple of the vistas in space look really good, a lot of depth to them, you know. It, it was never used, nothing ever flew at the screen, though, which I fucking hate when people do that. Hercules did that. I, that's something and, to fly at the screen, because I've jumped both times I've seen it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I never um, noticed. It's, yeah, it's when Drax is, you know, that 300 moment when he kills two people and then it like freeze frames as the bodies fly away. Oh, yeah. I Either immediately before that or immediately after that, he. Oh, does he throw his he knife? He clashes daggers with someone and their dagger flies at you. And I've oh, jumped right. both. Oh, shit, I didn't even know. Someone must have blinked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, generally the 3D is, is done pretty well. Uh, you know, yeah, it's. It, it's it's good, um, which I don't really see. I mean, I, the only reason I saw this in 3D was because of timings. I, I, I've, I've seen this film twice, I should say, by now. It's only been out for like three days, and I've already seen it twice. Um, yeah. Both times in 3D, uh, again, because of timings. But it was good. I mean, I don't. I, I didn't feel like I was... Um, like, uh, Planet of the Apes we saw recently, that was... I mean, it was 3D, but I didn't notice after about ten minutes. It was unnecessary. Whereas this... While I didn't notice the 3D all the time, there was every so often there was a really like big money shot that I thought, you know what, that looks really good in 3D. It's like a lot of depth to it. It just made it pop a bit more, which you don't often see yeah. really, which is good. Um, but yeah, this film is a, is a, is a great looking film. And uh, I... do you want to talk about the humour for a bit? Because this is yeah. probably one of the first films of the year as well. It's fucking hilarious, man. <laughs> oh it's God! It's amazing going to see a film, you know, and. Like as, when you see it the second time, I think it's it's more impressive because when you go see it the first time, it's like you're with everyone else laughing, and then the second time is was it actually funny? And then you get like you, you're judging the jokes based on the new audience, and they're all laughing as well. Yeah, I, yeah. you know, I I did that exactly. Like the first time I went was uh, Thursday night, so release night. Um, and pretty much everybody there, it was a right collection of fucking nerds. I'll tell yeah. you. Basically, exactly. everyone there who was obviously either a Marvel fan or a specifically a Guardians of the Galaxy fan, or just somebody like me who who was really interested in the film. Uh, although I might call the Guardians of the Galaxy fan now because I did read the 2008 yeah, yeah. one before this <laughs> now. Um, but everyone there was like a fucking right classy nerd, and like the the audience, they just fucking lapped it up. It was great. Like everyone was having a really good time. Everyone was laughing their heads off. It was great. And then I saw it uh, Sunday night last night, and it was a bit more of a normal kind of average. And the, the, the reaction wasn't quite as strong, but by the end of it, everybody was like still with it. Like Everybody had gotten yeah. really into it and was enjoying the hell out of it. Um, except, <laughs> except two people. Oh, yeah. Now, I think, this is, I think this is just odd. Now, I don't know whether it's because they didn't like the film, because it seemed an odd time to leave if you didn't like the film. But right before the climactic like, battle, on this, this this movie, two people walked out of my screen really? last night. And I was thinking, first of all, fuck you, you've got no taste. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to throw my drink at them. I was really pissed off because I, I, I was really having such a good time with this movie. And they like they kind of, <laughs> it sounds really petty, but they, they, they obviously didn't like it. And I, I took that as offense. Yeah. Um, but either, either they didn't like it and they, they left, but they really hung on for a long time. And th by the time they left, it was kind of like, look, if you just sit for half an hour more, you're going to get to the end of this movie and then get your money's worth. Just, you know, sit down, man. Uh, or they actually genuinely had to be somewhere, which seems odd that you're going to see like a two hour movie. Yeah, and that, you had that to be somewhere. Weird. So I don't really know what their deal was, but <laughs> two people left. Um, but they were the only ones who seemed to not have a good time. Like, you know, we said um, back in the, the Hercules review that <laughs> the first thing I heard people say coming out of that was, well, that was a bit shit. Whereas I heard the complete opposite. Like, everybody yeah. was really buzzing. Everyone was having a really good time. And, uh, you know, everyone seemed to enjoy it. But <laughs> coming back to the humour, this is a funny fucking film. It really is. <laughs> and, Pretty like, much. it ticks along nicely enough. But then every now and again, um, you you're virtually crying. Some of the lines just like fucking ridiculous. Something hits you so hard, and it's so unexpected. Like, the thing we talk about James Gunn is, in all of his other films, he has the freedom to do whatever he likes, and he likes to keep you guessing. He likes to do something completely random. 
and in those films, like every now and again, someone's head would get blown off or someone's leg will get beaten with a crowbar. He can't really do that here. No. <laughs> so now he just does something ridiculous with humour or with um, like the, the stupid soundtrack. And every now and again, he just throws jokes in at ridiculous moments. He's not expecting them. That's what makes him even funnier. Yeah, you're right. There's, there's some of like every character here is really funny though. I mean, you've got uh, you've got Chris Pratt playing Star Lord, and he's just like really charismatic and witty, and he has some great lines, and he's always trying to be like really suave and sophisticated, even yeah. though he's not at heart. You know, he's just like this <laughs> ragtag outlaw. Um, like Zoe Saldana is not is probably the straightest one in this movie. Yeah, she's like she's kind of like the you know, the sensible one who keeps them all on fucking track. <laughs> yeah, she's I the, guess she's like the mother, but even the she mother. has funny yeah. lines. Like where uh, like Star Lord's trying to seduce her, and she, yeah. she's like, "I'll not fall prey to your pelvis magic or pelvis sorcery." <laughs> <laughs> she does have funny lines, but she she plays them all straight. But that's part of being a good comic actress is being able to do that. Yeah, and, and let's face it, Gamora is a pretty serious character. As like, yeah. as she's not really a lot of laughs, um, but that that produces laughs in itself because she's coming up against these people who are just like fucking ridiculous. <laughs> quite frankly, I, I, I must admit, I really like Zoe Saldana a lot of the time, and I thought she was good as Gamora. Uh, she's she's written yeah. very different to how she is in the uh, the comic, um, but I still liked her. I thought she was good. Mm. Um, you know who was the biggest surprise in this movie for me? <laughs> was it David Batista? It was David Batista. <laughs> I was so worried about him because he was in the the last Riddick movie and he wasn't that good. He was a bit wooden. Uh, he had a yeah. few lines in that were, were that were quite funny, but it was he was a bit wooden. And I was thinking, oh god, uh, out of. Dave Batista and the talking raccoon. I was more worried about him, <laughs> uh, but I needn't have been. He is—he's probably one of the funnier people. Yeah, he's absolutely hilarious. Like he's—he plays Jax the Destroyer. Who, again, he's not like this in the comic, but in the movie, he takes everything super literally. He doesn't get metaphors or jokes or anything like that, and it's absolutely hilarious some of the stuff he comes out with like the bit where um, they're having a, the conversation about trying to come up with a plan and he, like he tries to interject it and Gamora's like look you don't get to make anything you don't get to make any decisions like we just decided five minutes ago after you pulled that, that shit back on the other planet he's like well wh when did we decide that <laughs> five seconds ago oh well, well I wasn't listening I was thinking about something else <laughs> it's just the way he does it like really huffy and so yeah <laughs> Oh man, he was he, some of the lines he comes out with when he like he, he calls fucking Gamora a green whore. Like yeah. he's like, you you green whore, you're my friend. <laughs> it's like for God's sake, we just stop talking. <laughs> I see, yeah, uh, and then what Nebula comes along and says something that's not as offensive, and he hits her with a rocket launch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one talks to oh, my friends that way. <laughs> he's just fucking class all the way through and like he's just like he's a psychopath like when they're going to like oh, a dangerous and deadly situation he's just laughing his head off yeah. constantly <laughs> and like he's mowing down like loads of henchmen with his knives cutting them to bits and he's laughing while he's doing it as if it's the <laughs> best time he's ever had and actually talking about Drax some of his fight scenes especially towards the end of the film where he's actually using his knife on kind of faceless henchmen for a 12A there's actually quite a lot of blood yeah I, you don't I didn't notice this ever I, like I never thought about the rating while I was watching this film and I think no. that's when you hit the rating perfectly, is when you do that. Yeah, it, it makes really good use. I mean, there's quite a lot of blood as he's, like, chopping through loads of these faceless guards, but it's car it's like it's like a luminous green, so you can get away with it. But I, I was thinking, this doesn't really st stop the fact that he's just, like, gutting people and cutting yeah. through them and, like, just well, destroying them. I thought there's them. really, like, when Groot sticks his branch through, like, 15 dudes' chests in a row... I know, I was thinking, shit, he's like... Even just... that's like, there's no blood, but still, I mean, you don't see anything like that in any of the other Marvel films. No. It's just because it's so out there, they're allowed to do it, or... I, th I kind of think so. It's it's still has such good humour as well. It's like, yeah. like that that whole thing with the branch is fucking ridiculous. <laughs> it's I, I, again... a laugh, um, I think, in my screenings. <laughs> yeah, it was so funny. Um, but again, like, saying uh, Drax is a great funny character, but fucking Rocket and Groot. Oh, my God, I wouldn't watch a movie with just uh, them. Too. Yeah, Jesus Christ, man! Who would ever thought a talking raccoon and a, a, like a silly tree would be like the most <laughs> emotional characters in a film? I know. Well, God, Groot, Groot will slay you with three words, really. I mean, towards the end of the film. Yeah, man. Good. I, I, again, I, I was a little bit like not worried, but I was a little bit concerned about how they were going to do Groot because in, in the comic, he's a lot more like 
like gnarled and twisted and a lot more branches that kind of trimmed him right down for the film and I was thinking oh, is he just going to be like a big heavy guy who punches people it is going to be like the Hulk but lighter version and he's not they, they, they make him a tree he grows at will he can like fire out vines and tie people up and all sorts of weird wonderful shit I thought it did really well with Groot um, yeah. but the CGI on Groot looked amazing as well it looked really really good yeah it, well it, I thought the CGI on Rocket was good I mean it's it's a raccoon in a tree and like the voices were added afterwards, and they interact so well with the cast. Yeah, um, yeah, they really I, do. I, I think I'm not sure what they did with Groot, but I know that Sean Gunn, the director's brother, who was also one of the Ravages, I think, he, he was rocket yeah. on set. Yes, he was, and then they more capped him, and then or at least yeah. captured him, and then and wrote the, the the real rocket in. Um, and he must have done a great job because it's it's so funny that when they're talking to they're talking to with like a raccoon that's not there, and it's so real. Yeah, I mean, like I was watching, I watching again last night. I was thinking, you know, like Groot looks really good. Like the the the, the tree, like his bark and everything looks really photorealistic. It looks great, and his face is also really well done. Yeah, um, and I thought that was good. But I was thinking, Rocket doesn't look quite as good. But then I was like watching, I'm going, you know, why he might not look as good? Because he's a fucking raccoon, like a cartoon raccoon, pretty much sitting there. Yeah, and he does like I don't know. I mean, furs harder. He, I don't think Rocket does look quite as good. He still looks pretty damn good. And he's yeah. one thing that I really liked about Rocket though is his face is very emo. Like he, he, there's so much emotion in his face. Yeah, and his ears. Like yeah, his ears. ears for an animal are really important um, in terms of like the way they feel and stuff. And they fucking nailed it. I've never seen ears like that on a fictional CG animal before. And I gotta say. Um, Bradley Cooper did a great voice oh, it's for fun. Rocket. It was, it's, you don't think it's Bradley Cooper at all. No. Even, well, I don't even know how to describe what sort of voice he's doing, because it always it's sounds like a, a bit Jersey-ish at the start. It's, it's, it is like a New York accent, isn't it? Like a, yeah. like a Brooklyn accent. Um, <laughs> but it's so good. It's like, it doesn't really sound, it sound like Bradley Cooper at all, which is what I was kind of worried about. I was thinking, are they just gonna, is it just going to be Bradley Cooper saying Rocket Raccoon lines? But no, it's not really. He, does, he actually does a proper voice. Yeah. Um, I was worried about that, because I'd, if they'd done that, it would have been awful. Yeah, it would have just been fucking Bradley Cooper talking through a raccoon, but no, he, the Rocket's like a proper character. And like I've said before, like, Rocket's probably, I mean, Groot's got some really cool emotional little bits as well, but Rocket's got a lot of stuff that's kind of touched on, but never really fully kind of laid out there. Like, yeah. he's like, he's a result of, like, horrific experiments, and he, he doesn't really like what he is, but he, he, he was never, you know, he, ne he never really got any choice in the matter, and he's really kind of bitter that people look down on him just because he's, like, he's, he's a fucking raccoon. Not yeah. that he knows what one is. Um, <laughs> I think that's a, a theme with all of the emotional side of things. I mean, with some of the characters like Gamora and Star-Lord, you know more about their backstory. But in yeah. terms of the amount of screen time or the amount of like um, emphasis they put on the backstory and the emotional stuff, it's only just sprinkled on the top because if they'd focus too much on it, it would have become corny. Well, you're right, you're right. This, I think when it's used with Rocket and say, it's used to great effect. You, you know, you get the, you, you kind of get what he's about and he is a little, you know, he has got this kind of bubbling anger under his surface, although it's not that under the surface a lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some of the scenes with Rocket as well are fucking hilarious, like when he gets pissed off and drunk because he, people keep calling them ver vermin and rolling yeah. and stuff. And uh, like a couple of, like a scene later, someone refers to him as Groot's pet. And his reaction is just like, what? How dare you? <laughs> it's just his reaction <laughs> amazing. I just like, I think my favorite Rocket line is um, after they've been to see the collector and they've found out what the Infinity Stone does. Oh. It's, um, it's in Gamora's pocket. And he's like, why the fuck do you still have it? <laughs> <laughs> I love as well when he's like, uh, he's. He's mocking Drax. He's like, "Oh, boo hoo! My wife and kid are dead." Yeah. <laughs> and Groot, and Groot's just like, "Ah!" <laughs> just the fucking expression Groot pulls is amazing. I like how petulant he gets when Star Lord's coming up with the plan. <laughs> oh, no, it's amazing. It's like, first of all, you're just saying you've got a plan. You copying off me from when I said that earlier in the film. <laughs> and secondly, I don't plan. think you've got a plan. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I actually liked about Rocket Raccoon. It wasn't like, you know, all these kind of random fucking characters from both sides of the fence of, like, good and evil just join together and magically they're all heroes. Like, Rocket Raccoon really doesn't want to be the hero all the way through. He does his utmost to basically try to get out of it. It's only because Groot yeah, every toy, wants every to be turn. good. Yeah, it's only because Groot kind of persuades him because he's, like, the best friends. Yeah. Um, that he kind of gets reluctantly dragged into it. <laughs> But no, uh, Rocket and Groot, man, they're so good. I would happily watch a film, a spin-off film with just them too. Oh, me too. And Which is ironic because Rocket Raccoon's got his own comic going at the moment and it features them too. 
Well, well, maybe we'll see. There's lots <laughs> of dates for Marvel that don't have films in yet. Exactly. And they've already done the, the, the bulk of the CGI work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I can't wait to see more Rocket and Groot, man. I fucking love them. But then again, like I said, all, all the characters here are really good. Um, fucking Michael Rooker, another James Gunn regular. Oh, yeah. Yondu. Yondu Udonta, who is a character, again, from Guardians of the Galaxy, but very, very different to his comic book kind of yeah. book. Yondu is actually one of the original Guardians from the, the future version that I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, whereas here, he's leader of the Ravagers, a, a bunch of space pirates who, who basically raise, kidnap and then raise Star-Lord. They kidnap, don't eat, and then raise Star-Lord. <laughs> yes, they don't, you know, you've got to be grateful for that type of thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, do you feel that they added him for the fans? Because they need, they like, they might um, as well. Kind of, yeah. I think I think they basically needed um, that Yondu part. I think they had that in yeah. mind, and were like, "Oh, well, why don't we just make it Yondu?" Yeah, because that's, that's what I was wondering. We're using, yeah. a, we're using a character who's never otherwise going to be used. Yeah. Um, and I'm fine. Michael Rugger was great. Uh, oh, Yondu yeah. was a class character. He was like, he was a villain, but at the same time, he wasn't. At, like, you know, he was like a. I don't know, a frenemy, that's the best word. Yeah. <laughs> but he was really good. Like, everyone's really frightened of him all the way through this film, and you're kind of like, I don't really know why. I mean, what's his, what's so dangerous about this guy? And then later on, you kind of get to see why he's so feared. Yeah. <laughs> and it's mint. It's so good. Uh, but Michael Rucker, man, I always love that guy. Yeah, that, he's, he's great. Um, I can't wait. We're going to watch Slither soon, and he's uh, he's obviously the... Would you like, call him the antagonist in that? Yeah, uh, Yeah, I would suggest so. But, he's class. Uh, he is class, and again, he's in uh, Super as a as, what, Kevin Bergen's henchman. Yeah. <laughs> um, and oh yeah, I tell you what else he's in. This is such a random fucking one. It's not a James Gunn movie at all. It's actually um, it's well, it's a Sylvester Stallone movie. Do you remember Cliffhanger? Yeah. He's the uh, the rival like mountaineer that's rival to <laughs> Stallone. He's come Except a long way. <laughs> he's got like he's got like curly hair and that though. It's before he goes bald. <laughs> I'm going to have to have a look. <laughs> he looks really young. It's ridiculous. But ah, I always like Michael Rugger, man. He's, he's cool. And Yondu was, was really good. I, I really liked him. They made him a proper like gnarly space pirate. With, like, yeah. His teeth were all really crooked. And he had like some metal ones. And I, I did, love how I lived in like all him. of their costumes were as well. Like it wasn't yeah. just... I mean, I guess in Star Wars, it's like, oh, look at this perfectly tailored suit that you're going to wear in the next action scene. And then you see like Chris Pratt's entrance and the other Ravager's first entrance. It's just like... These jackets look beat the shit out of. Where did yeah. they get them from? It's just like they've lived in them for like the last 20 years. Yeah. I also liked mm-hmm. um, the, the Ravager logo, which is like a, a flame. Yeah, with a line through it. Uh, yeah, well, that was um, that's like the, the logo that's on Star-Lord's helmet in the, the 2008 run. So they kind of adapted that from Star-Lord to, make it, to inc- be able to incorporate it into his uniform in this, yeah. this movie, which I quite liked. Um, little nod well, interestingly, on the Marvel store, I was just looking at before we came on, if you want to go and buy a Guardians of the Galaxy logo T-shirt, um, that is the, what they're calling the Guardians logo. Yeah, I think the Guardians adopted as their kind of their, their yeah. sigil, as it were. Um, but yeah, yeah, Michael Rooker was class. Not in it a huge amount. Well, uh, he's actually in it a fair amount, I suppose. Yeah, he, he sort of builds screen time as the film goes on, really. Yeah. Um, and and then, course, like, yeah, in the Nova Corps, we got um, John C. Riley, Peter Serfinowitz, and Glenn Close. Yeah, Glenn Close. Christ, I haven't seen him Glenn Close, for a while. Favourite Glenn Close performance, Country Mile. For a awesome. bit. Yeah. I think she was it. I, again, it, like all these people, they seem to be just filling in kind of random, like, you know, bit parts with, with fairly well known names just to kind of make them a bit more. Uh, maybe carry a bit more weight to them. Like John C. Riley's not in this a whole a lot. No, but he's. I, I like. I just can't help but like John C. Riley. He's awesome. Uh, I just and, like Glenn Close. She has one line in the film. She has one word. Um, I think uh-huh. yeah, it's when she just talked to the Kree commander um, who's refusing to help, and it's just you didn't expect Glenn Close to ever be saying that. Yeah, I remember that. And she delivers yeah. it so well. I, I really like Glenn Close, and I actually expected her like to be like just a bitch, like you know the kind of like oh I'm not listening to the, to Star Lord or anything like that. They're just yeah. idiots. But she wasn't like that at all. Actually, she was like a, you know she was a capable leader, which I quite liked. Yeah. She, just, she didn't just get in the way to create like a, a you know problems for the story. It was just she was just there, and she was like the head of the Nova Corps, which I quite liked. Um, and you got Peter Serafinowicz, as you mentioned, as kind of one of the one of the other uh, Nova Corps kind of high ups. Maybe like he seemed to be like the field marshal, like the guy who goes out in a battle but leads them all in battle. 
Yeah. Uh, at least he seemed to be like that in the, the final kind of climax. But um, you've got Benicio Del Toro there as well as the Collector, previously oh, yeah. seen in the post credit stinger. Not in it. He's in it, probably the post credit stinger more than, of Thor 2 than he was in this movie. <laughs> yeah, it's entirely possible, yeah. Uh, I really like that scene because it, was... it, it happens in every Marvel movie when it's just like... I think in Thor 2, it was Odin telling Natalie Portman about what the ether does. Yeah. Well, and it's that's like a it. necessary backstory that you have to tell. And in this film, but like the collector's telling it, and then Rocket's like yawning and like, we'd, like we don't need a history lesson. Just give <laughs> yeah, us the money. Just, yeah, just give us the money, man. It's like they, they fully referenced the fact that it's happened in every Marvel film so far. And we don't need it. The thing is, as well, because obviously a big actor like Benito Del Toro, it, and the fact that he wasn't really used all that much... I get the feeling that they could, they're going to quite happily, or they could quite happily pull the collector back into things later on and use him a bit more. Yeah, it's almost like they've laid, they've laid the groundwork if they ever need to use him again. Because the collector is a, he's not a major bad guy, but he certainly is a villain in his own right in the comics. Although he's not a villain in this, so they've certainly got room no. to, to expand his his role. Um, and of course, it leads into a little cameo for, for comic book fans, his his appearance as well, which I, I quite liked. For who, sorry? For a, for, the, for a character from the comic who's not otherwise in the movie. I see. <laughs> um, so keep an eye on for that. Um, Did you know yeah. the, um, the slug from Slithers in his collection as well? Is it? Yeah. Oh, man, I didn't notice that. <laughs> and uh, That's pretty good. Yeah, you'll have to wait and watch the post-credits thing for something interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah it, probably, post- it doesn't set anything up whatsoever, I, well, it, I hope. I know, I really hope it doesn't, but it's still quite funny. It's like a, yeah. it's like the comedy one, like uh, Iron Man for uh, Iron Man Three's post credit thing. It's like one for laughs. Um, yeah, and it was it's it's dripping with James Gunn. He, he was clearly his idea. Yeah, but it's really obscure as well. Like I don't think a lot yeah. of people got it at my screening. Yeah, like, I don't think many people got it at mine, and even people I was with were like, they knew who the, who it was and stuff, but they they didn't know the significance of it. Yeah, it was, it's fun though, but uh, yeah, I think we'll see more of uh, Del Toro in, in films to come, but I mean, the, 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 uh, we're talking about a lot of the big players here, um, I mean, you got, sorry, somebody we didn't pick up on is uh, Karen Gillan, who played Oh, Nebula. of course, yeah. Um, I really liked her actually in this film. Yeah, she was good. She was, um, she had, I really liked Lee Pace's um, Ronin, but I did want to speak about Ronin. There was mainly costume and writing than him, himself. Well, I was going to speak about Ronan, but like Karen Gillan, I really like this Nebula. Um, she's very, again, slightly different to her comic book counterpart, but still good. She's like this cybernetic assassin with blue skin and loads of kind of tech buried into her. And she's kind I like of, how she's uh, a bit of a head, because we haven't really had that in a villain so far. Yeah, she is. Like, she, she's just like pure anger and bitterness, and she's not really nice, to be honest. She was, she was a decent villain. I wish she'd maybe been in it a little bit more, to be honest. Um, Future ones, though, based on her exit of this one. Yes, I, I fully expect her to come back in future ones, maybe, quite possibly, even the Infinity Gauntlet. Um, yeah. But Lee Pierce, I mean, you mentioned Lee Pierce uh, playing Ronan. Uh, and I've, I've got mixed feelings about Ronan as a villain. Uh, on the one yeah, hand, I thought, I thought Lee Pierce was very menacing. I thought Ronan was suitably evil and menacing and big and bad and, and dastardly. And I thought Lee Pierce did a good job in that regard. And I think if there's a flaw to, to say about Ronan, I don't think it's really down to him. I think that Ronan's very much an underdeveloped villain. He suffers a bit like Malakath did in For the Dark World in that he's just kind of one-dimensional. He's bad, and that's pretty much all there is to him. Yeah, well, I agree with you, but I, I, don't, I think Malakath was done more of a disservice than Ronan was. Yeah, I, I must admit. Then, um, yeah. I think on the flip side, you see, he's underdeveloped and he's just there to be evil, but in this film, it kind of works because you've got the Guardians, this ragtag, ridiculous bunch of characters who are cracking wise and like bumbling through things. And then on the other side, you've got this like ridiculously evil, for the sake of being evil, force. And it, I, I like, agree. The, the sort of ridiculous nature of both sides makes it kind of work this time around. No, I, I, I agree. Just a bit boring. Yeah, Malekith didn't really have any. any... Yeah, he didn't really have anything more to do with than being bad. Whereas, yeah, I, I, I do agree. I don't dislike Ronan. I thought he was suitably good. Yeah. Um, and I thought Lee Pierce I did a good job. I think he's probably my second favourite Marvel villain so far. I, unless I'm forgetting some. After who? Trevor. <laughs> Loki. <Lord, Lord>, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like him well enough. Um, he was good. I, I did like Lee Pierce. I was trying to think where the fuck do I know Lee Pierce from, but he's playing uh, King Thranduil. 
in yeah, the, in the Hobbit. Hobbit. Um, that's where I know him from. Um, so he's, he's in a lot of kind of big budget shit at the moment. But yeah, Rona was Rona was okay. He was suitably evil, and I think you can kind of get away with this two dimensional bit because this obviously sets him up as like a lackey of Thanos, and it's yeah. kind of like, well, he's not really the the big bad, so I don't care if he gets disposed of. I hope Thanos is a bit more developed, and he's seen as he's popping up here and there, he maybe will be, especially yeah. going into Phase Three after uh, the next Avengers film. Um, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of him before we even get to Guardians too. Oh, I I hope so. I just like Thanos; he's a cool villain. But yeah, there's nothing wrong. I thought uh, Lee Pace did did well with what he what he had to go. Um, you know, it, it did kind of brush over who he was and why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah. But it didn't really go into a whole lot of detail. And I didn't mind because I I was much rather have screen time with the heroes in this film. You're, you're right. You're, you're right. It didn't really, in my opinion, didn't really damage the film. I think if they did develop a bit more without damaging the rest of the film, it would have would have made him a bit more interesting. Yeah. Um, especially because Ronan's an interesting character in the comics because he started off as an outright villain and then proceed progresses to be. Um, a, a kind of like a just a, a somebody who lives in the universe with his own kind of desires and needs and wants and, and opinions on things. He's not always a bad guy. Yeah, uh, he's actually sometimes a good guy or whatever. Um, but whereas this version of him was very much just no, I'll kill everybody. There's no redeeming me. I'm a villain. So it was almost like well, I don't think it damages the film. It was almost a bit of a shame to like burn through such a, a character with with so much potential as it were going forward. But then again. There's You're going to have to do someone. Yeah, there's 50 years worth of material to draw from, so I don't think they're ever going to run out of people. And quite frankly, one of the things I've, I've always not really been annoyed at, but kind of gotten sick of is the fact that Loki's a bit overused in Thor movies. Yeah. And, me, and, you know, it's nice to kind of jump from villain to villain, so I'm not going to say it. Like, you know, it's, it's almost you damned if you do, you damned if you don't. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, Christ. So uh, generally the cast is very good. I liked everybody in it. There was nobody who kind of thought, God damn, you, you're not earning your money here. I, I thought it was generally all quite good. Um, I thought the villains actually were quite, like, they, they reminded me of Power Ranger villains, but in a, like a good way. Yeah, I can see that. They were like really bad and villainous and big and, and like kind of galactic threats. And I quite liked that because it fit in with the silliness like, of, of yeah. the whole thing. Um but yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's come across, but I really, really fucking like this movie. I mean, saw it twice in three days. Um, really I can't look- praise this enough. It's, it is very base. It's fun. And like when you layer in all of the other compliments on top of that, it's just, just fantastic. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. This is a fun movie. I had such a good time with this movie. I can't remember the time, the last time I had such an outright good time with a movie. And it was a time, I've like, since seeing it, I've kind of never really stopped thinking about it. No, as me well. either. Like, I, always <laughs> I keep replaying say, scenes in my head. I keep it, singing the songs. Yeah, it's just in the back of my mind pretty much since I watched it, um, which is usually the sign of a good movie, I think, if, especially if you're rem- remembering it because you, you liked it rather than because you didn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I think that that's a real testament to it. And while I don't think anyone's going to come and say this is like the greatest fucking drama or the more serious movie that's going to move you and all the rest of it, it certainly has its moments. But I don't. It doesn't matter because this is such a good time and it ticks it like it, it, it ticks the, all the right boxes in the right way and hits all the right notes. It's a it's an incredibly fun kind of summer blockbuster. This is the best summer movie that I think there's been. Yeah, I personally agree. You you're right. It's not going to win any awards, it's not going to blow anyone away from the acting or whatever, but I personally rank this up as probably my favourite film, just to sit and watch and have a good time. It's certainly, like, I think it probably is one of my new kind of favourites. Every so often I get a movie that I just love, and this is, yeah. this is certainly one of them. I really like it. I, I'm pretty much already dedicated myself to going back a third time uh, yeah, before me too. I leave cinemas. I don't think I'm going to go in the next week or so, because I think I'll just overload myself with it, but <laughs> certainly... Certainly, before it leaves cinemas, I'll I'll be going to see it again just just because I don't want to wait. Um, I know that's really release. such a long because this is definitely a day one Blu-ray purchase. Oh yeah, and I haven't done a day one Blu-ray pur- purchase for a long time. So yeah, I've, uh, yeah, certainly, certainly, definitely getting it. Um, I can't wait. Um, and, and I've got to say, I think that the promotion of this film did a really good job because looking at the box office statistics, it did ninety four million in in one weekend for in America, which set a new August record. I think it did about six million in the UK as well. I don't know if that's particularly good, but it's you know it's all right. It's yeah, it's all right. So. <laughs> um, I think the the only thing you know, I don't think the promotion was going to get everyone, but I know there's a 
a lot of people out there that still think, oh, it doesn't really look like it's for me. And then I just go, it, it is. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you're right. So I was talking to somebody at work today and they yeah, they basically said, look, um, I don't know if I'm going to go and see it because my, my, my partner doesn't really fancy it. He doesn't think the trailers look very good. And I don't want to, I don't want to go to the cinema by myself. And I was like, oh, fair enough. You're missing out. But, you know, yeah. um, fair enough. And I think that might be a, a lot of people's kind of, you know, if you, I think if you, you think, oh, it doesn't look very good. Well, fair enough. First of all, it might not just be your thing, but I would also, I would say that at least give it a chance because I think you're going to be missing out otherwise. This is a really, really fun, exciting, you know, touching movie as well. That's very well yeah. made. It's very unique. It does what it wants. To, it, it, it is what it wants to be. And it's all the better for it. It does justice to the source material. And I can't wait to see more of the Guardians. It's probably my most anticipated film now as well, Guardians 2. We've really? got Avengers 2 to come in between. And I really couldn't give a shit now. <laughs> I, I, kind of, I know what you mean. I've kind of like lost interest <laughs> in non-cosmic stuff. Like, yeah. I just really want like I just really want the cosmic stuff to come into it more. I, like, uh, I just want to see Thanos. I want to see more of the Guardians. I want to see the Infinity Gauntlet. And Age of Ultron, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll be, I'm sure it'll be good, but I, I'm not really that excited for it either. I'm sure I will be close to the time. It, it, yeah. it always happens, but yeah, I, I'm really so I believe more uh, it's what is it, July twenty eighth, twenty seventeen. Uh, yes, yes, twenty seventeen. Yep. Yeah, so, three less years. than three years ago. <laughs> oh well, so we've now got another movie to hype until it comes out. <laughs> oh god, that's it. I can't wait to get on this hype train. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a tough act to follow, but um, yeah, I, I can't recommend this enough. And um, I think we will yeah, about sorry, our, like... James Gunn was asked, while Guardians was racking up an impressive box office, they were asking him what he did over the weekend. And he's like, um, I didn't do anything on Saturday. And then on Sunday, when the first numbers started to come in, I got so excited. He started writing the script. <laughs> and I just love that. It's like, yeah. that's the sort of passion I like behind the project. He just generally seemed to like this, that doing this. Um, he seems to have had a good time doing it as well. Uh, yeah. I certainly had a good time watching it. So yes, me too. I think uh, for your, your non-spoiler review, we actually wheeled out our kind of super editor's choice award. For yeah. Three and, um, and you know what? I was, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I love <laughs> this movie. I really do. I was kind of, when, it, when you did that, I was kind of like, uh, is it going to be that good? I hope it's not going to let me down. And I, it didn't. I often do overestimate things sometimes. Like, um, I Sometimes I need to wait a bit before I write my review. Like, I think I was jumping the gun with my amazing Spider-Man review. Uh, <laughs> but not this one. This one I was spot on. And I've seen it twice now. It's been two weeks since I've seen it the first time. I'm still right. It's a gold yeah. stop movie. It's it's great. I uh, I had such a good time with it. Um, there's there's a few things that could have been done better, but they're, they're nitpicking in what is otherwise a great film and possibly Marvel's best and certainly my favorite of their, their cinematic universe. Yeah, easily, easily. I love it. Uh, as I say, I've seen it. Yeah, I've also seen it twice um, in rapid succession as well. So that that hopefully is a is a I don't know feather in its cap in itself. And I'm certainly I'm certainly committed to going at least once more before it leaves cinemas. Yeah, and I encourage everyone who's on the fence um, go see it because I'm even if like you don't enjoy it as much as we have, I'm sure you'll enjoy it enough, and you'll take something from it. Yeah, I, I, again, you might not. You, you've, you, again, you've said it great there. You, you might not fall in love with it like we kind of have, but you will certainly. There's not no reason you wouldn't have a good time with this movie. It's funny. It's witty. It's sharp. It's just. It's good. It's great. It's, it's a good time. Ah, Thing like me, set me. They call themselves the Guardians of the Galaxy. This might not be the best idea.